Welcome, everyone. My name is Heather Gallenbeck, and I'm a member of the Kellogg Alumni Relations Team. Today's presentation will last about 60 minutes. Dean Cornelli and our distinguished alumna, Stephanie Gallo, will open with a conversation and will address select audience questions throughout the session. We encourage you to submit your questions at any time during the program using the Q&A icon located at the bottom of your screen. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on Kellogg's YouTube channel next week. On behalf of the Kellogg School of Management, thank you for joining us today. With that, I will turn it over to Dean Cor well, welcome uh, to another conversation with a uh, distinguished alumni. I uh, have received so many emails from many of you saying how much you enjoy them. And I am delighted uh, today I am joined for an from another fantastic alumna, Stephanie Gallo. Thank you, Stephanie, for uh, coming, uh, for joining us uh, today. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. I'm humbled to say the least. <laughs> No, we are very proud to showcase the amazing alumni we, we, we have so that, you know, and, and how they all represent the Kellogg community, the Kellogg spirit. And, and Stephanie is uh, definitely uh, representing very well uh, Kellogg. She's, she is a chief, March, uh, chief marketing officer at her family uh, winery since 99. Uh, before she was sale manager for Romano Brothers Beverage Company. And I understand that she has been instrumental in the development of innovative new product. And don't I always say how Kellogg produces innovative people? And she's also been uh, instrumental in uh, pioneering the brand online presence, event marketing initiatives, and really uh, expanding the brand globally. So uh, we, we're gonna take all the merit for all these successes. <laughs> anyway, uh, I just want to start asking question. Everybody I'm sure is uh, eager to hear from you. You can put questions in the q and I can ask at the end or they are relevant to what we are discussing in the moment. I can weave them in in the present discussion. Now, uh, Stephanie, let me ask you with the one question. We're asking a lot because of course we are all in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. There's a lot going on and we want to know what happened uh, for you, right? Did you have to change marketing uh, a strategy and all about the, you know, because closer reduction of restaurant, the business, how did it affect how you worked at, at, at Gallo? It's, I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's the question, it's the question of the year. Just to give you uh, context for what I'm going to share with you, um, what has happened with the global pandemic is that consumption of alcohol beverage has shifted from, in addition to off-premise consumption, um, on-premise consumption has shifted to the home. And just to give you a sense of uh, what that means for our business is that within the last seven months, we estimate that there's been over 4 million new consumers that have entered our category. And we call this a COVID silver lining um, because in January, 2020, before uh, the global pandemic, it was gonna be the first time in 15 years that the wine category in the United States was going to slow down. And what COVID has brought um, to the wine industry and quite candidly to the alcohol beverage industry is that more consumers have now entered into the category than we've ever seen. So we now have 4 million new consumers that have entered into the category. So, you know, one of our key marketing strategies um, that we're embracing is now that they're starting to come into the category, learning to enjoy wine on what we know is a regular basis, how do we keep them engaged? And we're spending a tremendous amount of time really talking about innovation whether it's through product, whether it's through packaging, whether it's through go-to-market, uh, marketing innovation, how do we continue to keep our new friends to the wine category engaged? The second thing that we've seen is that now that consumers are spending more time at home, 
we've pivoted the way that our that we engage with our consumers. I think everyone of legal drinking age has engaged in some type of virtual happy hour event. Um, but people are really looking for virtual experiences. So a lot of our experiences that were done, um, you know, person to person, we've pivoted them to offer our consumers virtual experiences. And we're really leveraging digital technology, social media to make our brand ambassadors, our winemakers, our chefs even more accessible to consumers. And I think the third thing um, that has really changed for us is how do we leverage technology to help our on-premise partners during this time? And you know, there's there's two key things that we've done. One, I'm really proud of our sales organization. Um, they've they've pivoted to start offering virtual seminars to the on-premise community in terms of how they can pivot their business, you know, through online, um, setting up to-go business. And the second that we're noticing in the on-premise environment is that restaurateurs and on-premise operators are extremely entrepreneurial and we're starting to see a new channel emerge, which is called the to-go channel. And so we're pivoting our business to, um, to help our on-premise operators meet the going need of the growing need of, of to-go business. So those are just some examples of how we've pivoted our business to, to capitalize on the fact that um, alcohol beverage is considered an essential business during this time. And um, we're, we're definitely a beneficiary and what we call a COVID silver lining. That's very interesting. But, it, and you, you know, we went there, at least we expect it to be a relatively short crisis, maybe yeah. until the summer. Now, you know, we are setting in in this uh, new normal. How do you win a transition from reacting to a short-term crisis into <laughs> in for a while? <laughs> So, um, you know, it was funny because we had talked about this question. I've had some opportunity to reflect on it. And I, I think that it's important to give you a context in terms of, of how we approached it. So we, we transitioned our workforce to a remote workforce. I'll never forget this on Thursday, March 11th. And I know that because my dad's birthday is on Friday, March 12th. And, um, you know, I, I was, I was talking to, to my brother, um, Who's, who's now our CEO and and you know I said to him we we have to transition over to a remote work environment and and we basically pivoted overnight um, to a remote work environment and what we recognized is that um, is that during sorry there's a train passing by <laughs> <laughs> delivering wine to people. <laughs> That, that's, um, that's the new normal. <laughs> new normal, yeah. It's it's a it's a train. I apologize. That wasn't planned. Um, but we implemented a we implemented a framework where we really wanted to one be transparent with with our employees, but two, we really wanted to encourage people to operate with an extraordinary amount of flexibility, empathy, and compassion during this time, and. What was interesting was that we thought that operating with flexibility, empathy, and compassion would be a short-term thing like you talked about. And really, I quite candidly think that it's the theme for 2020. Um, and it served us well in terms of helping us navigate the social unrest, the economic downturn. And in California, we have something unique called the California wildfires, which I know we'll talk about later, but giving our employees the opportunity um, to operate with flexibility, to operate with empathy and compassion has been extremely beneficial. And I think it's gonna be the theme for, <laughs> for the foreseeable future. So that's how we've transitioned from crisis management to the new normal by operating around that framework. And I, I see now two questions here from two different people who are actually connected in a follow-up. One's asking, did your global supply chain got disrupted and how did your company navigating through that? And the other, which is kind of related is with increasing retail sales, which I believe is the bulk of your business. How are you keeping up with the demand for your wines? Oh, I think both great questions. So uh, in general, our global supply chain was, was not disrupted. Um, and, you know, so, so we were, we were very, very, um, you know, we had short-term disruption due to the increase in demand, but we were, we were able to 
um, we were able to catch up um, <laughs> relatively quickly. Um, as far as keeping up with demand, yeah, it caught us off guard. Um, and you know what we noticed was that during this time, um, our well-established brands with high brand recognition um, accelerated. Uh, growth on those items accelerated. And so we, um, we shifted, we pivoted, and we basically prioritized um, the SKUs that, um, that were essential. And we also, in order to keep up with demand, and this is, a, this is something that we created during, um, during COVID that I think is gonna be a regular thing moving forward that we offer the network, we started creating pallet programs. Um, where we were, we were creating pallet programs that we can then offer to our customers just to be able to keep up with the demand. So yes, it was a little bit rocky for a couple months, but um, I'm pleased to say that, that, that I think we've caught up. That's fantastic. And uh, let me ask a bit, Zalid, looking at in general, right? You, you've talked about uh, your framework of flexibility, empathy, and compassion. That's what I love it because it's you know so much the yeah. also the Kellogg values. Uh, can you give some examples on how it's shaped the ways Gallo is interacting with customer, employees, uh, and and general the greater community? And to what extent it changed pre-COVID or during the during the crisis? Uh, how so, you... so one of the things that that I'll talk about you know from an employee standpoint first and foremost is that. Um, we, we, we listen constantly and we're proactive in our communication style and we've adjusted it. You know, I think that when you're in the middle of a crisis, you're constantly, we were communicating, but we adjusted it so that we, we were more empathetic um, in terms of how we communicated the news. Um, we, uh, we made a commitment to our employees that we were gonna be as transparent as possible. And one of the ways that we do, did this is that we now have a weekly town Paul called CMO Live. I first did it for, we've talked about it, but I first did it for the marketing team. And what I recognized was that because everyone was dispersed, I actually invited the entire company to join CMO Live. And every week during, um, during, the, during COVID surge, I would give examples of how we as an organization were operating with flexibility, empathy, and compassion. So you know, proactive communication. The other thing that we try to do is really leverage Instagram to do evening wind down. I do evening wind downs, you know, to highlight the amazing work that our, that our colleagues are doing. It's a way to stay connected. Uh, this week to take a page out of Kellogg, we're doing a virtual spirit week to try to keep our company culture going um, during this time um, to continue to foster it. So that's from an employee standpoint. From a customer standpoint, as I mentioned to you before, um, we really um, wanted to help, for example, our on-premise operators pivot their business models. Our sales team started offering virtual seminars on how they can pivot their business during this time. You know, the first time we did it, we thought that maybe 25 people would show up. We had over a hundred restaurateurs in a very specific region join and we learned from that region and we applied it um, geographically throughout the United States. The second thing that we did is that during the pandemic is that we created a program called ROAR, which stands for rescuing our amazing restaurants. And we encourage our sales organization to purchase meals from our on-premise partners and then donate those meals to first responders or to organizations that are in need of meals. So that's been, you know, really successful. I think to date we've we've spent over $750,000 on that program. And then finally from a community standpoint, I think this is the thing that I am most proud about is that um, we recognize that that our frontline workers as well as our our communities where we do business were in desperate need of hand sanitizer. Um, and so we pivoted um, one of our spirits manufacturing lines and we produced over a hundred thousand bottles of hand sanitizers all with employee volunteers um and so we ran shifts i gosh i don't even know for a couple months that were five days a week 24 hours a day and our employees came in from all over california to help participate and and, and makes hand sanitizers um 
for, for our communities. And, you know, to this day, we still get messages from hospitals, nursing homes, um, you know, police organizations, fire organizations, thanking us for, for, for pivoting our business to, to help uh, with the hand sanitizer shortage that was happening. So, um, you know, we've made, we've, we asked our employees to make masks when there was a mask shortage. So, um, you know, I think that one of the things that Kellogg has instilled in us is that when you are leading a business, you, you, you have a responsibility to be a force for good within your community. And if you have that ability, um, you, you need to take advantage of it and, and, and pivot your business to help wherever you can. That is that is great because exactly that's what also we are trying to tell uh, students exactly you know this, there is a demand for leaders who are a force for good and lead with empathy so it's it's great to hear you saying uh, these things. Um, I, I see a lot of question about actually uh, the industry. So before I get into the specific of those questions, let me ask you a more general question I get, which is like, what are the most interesting pandemic related trends you are seeing the beverage uh, industry, Betty announced about in general as trends and what really surprised you about the consumers? Okay, so you qualified it with surprising. So the obvious is obviously, you know, the sale, you know, um, consumers adopting e-commerce, right? Online has um, has accelerated. Um, virtual experiences have accelerated. But but you did word uh, you did use the word interesting. So <laughs> um, uh, I could share with you some interesting trends. Cocktail culture is back um, because on premise is shut down. Um, consumers are enjoying at home cocktail hour and and learning how to make cocktails. So that's been an interesting trend. Ready to drink cocktails are on fire. Uh, every week I look at that number and it's, it's, it just is on fire driven by, believe it or not, at home margarita consumption. So that's an interesting trend. I need to adopt this trend. <laughs> um, sweet tasting wines off the charts, off the charts. So um, whether it's over sweet tasting wines or, um, or wines that don't market themselves as sweet, but are sweet off the charts. And I think it makes sense because when I told you that there's 4 million new consumers coming into the category, they're coming in through sweeter tasting wines. So that's an interesting fun fact. Uh, sparkling wines. Uh, so sparkling is usually reserved for celebratory occasions. I think that during this time, people are looking for moments to celebrate. Um, I think we call them small days, so small little holidays to um, just keep, um, just to make them happy. So sparkling wines are are on fire, and um, you know what, what is here to stay. You know what we say um, constantly: our consumer insights people are amazing. Uh, when this first started, they said, Stephanie. Um, you know, it takes eight weeks for a habit to form. And we're now in month seven. <laughs> and I think that what I hope stays, and I think one of the reasons why our category is growing during this time is that people are slowing down, they're connecting over a bottle of wine, over a meal or with their family and friends. And I hope that stays after the pandemic. I think people are rediscovering the value of a, of a meal together when they're not driving their kids to whatever practice or commitment that they have. And um, I hope that family meals and um, continue past the, the pandemic. So I'm told that they will, but, um, but I, I hope that, that we take stock and, and reflect on that. That's a good trend to, to hope for. I see here a slightly related dema, uh, question. Uh, so you refer to new, 4 million new consumers. And there's a question, how are these new 4 million wine consumers spread across the price spectrum? Oh. Are they grouped into select Gallo brands? So, um, so this is something that, that, that we, are, we are looking, we're looking um, that we're looking at closely. Um, Believe it or not, they're coming in through 
first of all, 19% of the 4 million are coming in through what we're calling sweeter offerings. Um, they're naturally gravitating towards, um, towards your bigger brands. And by the way, it's at all price points. So I think the key is if you have an established brand with high brand awareness, at $5, at $10, at 15 and at 20, you, you are a beneficiary of that. So, you know, I think that one of the challenges that we have in wine is that we're trying to create a branded and non-branded category. And what COVID has taught us is that brands matter. <laughs> So I, I, I don't know if I answered the question directly, but it's the brand first that we're seeing. No, that's, I, I think, uh, absolutely. Uh, and actually I have here, it's not exactly the pandemic, but if you want this recent trend, it's what impact, if any, have the tariffs on European wines had on the demand for American wines? You know, we're, we're trying to sort through it. I think the... Um, I think that what's hard to untangle is that a lot of, and we do have a lot, you know this, um, Francesca, we have a luxury Italian portfolio and um, Sorry. it's correlated to our on-premise customers. And so, um, yes, European wines in general have been impacted partly because of tariffs, but more importantly, because the on-premise channel um, is slowing down. So it, it's multiple factors as to um, as to what is impacting it. Um, you know, with that being said, La Marca Prosecco is an Italian import and um, because it's sparkling and because it's La Marca, it's, it's, it's doing very, very well during this time. That's good to say, to know as an Italian. <laughs> Uh, I have another question here, sir. Where are you investing in 2021 to continue to drive the brand forward? So we are investing um, in developing new capabilities, um, primarily around what I would say e-commerce. Um, and we're also investing in talent. You know, I think that... Um, one of the benefits of being family owned and operated, and I know that we're going to go ahead and, and get into this, is that, um, is that, and we're going to continue to invest in our brands. We, we didn't, I know that a lot of companies scale back in, in, in AMP and, and brand investment. We're not, we're going to continue to, to invest heavily behind our brands. Um, but we want to be opportunistic with talent as, as companies are laying people off as, um, as industries are furloughing people, we we want to be aggressive and 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 hire um, best in class talent during this time. So people and capabilities is where we're making our investment. Fantastic. And before I move on to other uh, things, there's one more specific to COVID. How does your production process adapt to minimizing the COVID transmission to assure the safety of your product? Oh, great question. Um, you know, I, the way that I, the way that I want to answer it is that um, from the start, we have always wanted to keep the health and safety, our employees at the forefront of, of, of what we're doing. So uh, we have a pretty robust process where everyone has to get tested um, when they, when they walk into the door, there's definitely a self-reporting aspect of it, but you know, everyone is in protective equipment. Um, everyone has to maintain social distancing. So, um, you know, we, we take it, we take it very, very seriously. That's important. Uh, I, actually, there's one more on the COVID. It says, excellent presentation. Uh, <laughs> what will be the one, two key permanent changes COVID will bring to your business and consumer package goods in general? I know you talked a little bit also about the family and the gathering and drinking. But if there's other, you know, permanent changes that you think you'll stay with COVID, I I think that um, a permanent change that is is here to stay. Um, and I know this is obvious, but it for our industry, it's a big deal, and a lot of it has to do with how we have to go to market through a three tier distribution system. But I think that what I know, I don't think COVID has accelerated. Um, the adoption of e-commerce and alcohol beverage. 
um, whether it's through um, convenience oriented sites like Drizzly, whether it's through Instacart, whether it's ordering wine directly from um, wineries. Um, I even see it, you know, within, within there's, there's folks that have never ordered wine online that have done that during this time. And I know that because I don't, anyways, I know that one, because of our numbers and two, because there's a direct correlation between online and your consumer engagement team that has to deal with people calling in. And I think that once you um, experience that, it makes it easy to find shop and, and enjoy wines that you like. So I know it's obvious, but I think that um, the adoption of e-commerce is, is gonna be important and it's here to stay. And you, you know, I, I think you mentioned before um, the, the, the part about the family business, right? You work in a family business. And what were the unique advantages and challenges of, of being a family business in uh, whether in the pandemic for you? Um, I think first and foremost is that um, being a family-owned business is that the benefit of being a family-owned business is that you can make decisions and investments for the long term because you don't necessarily have to um, answer to to Wall Street or, or the equity markets and it has its advantages during this time you know as I mentioned to you before we're going to invest in building capabilities we're going to invest in technology we're going to invest in talent and that's a luxury that I think many companies um, don't have during during this time. Um, you know, an example of of being a family owned business is that throughout the pandemic, you know, during the first seven weeks, eight weeks, nine weeks, um, there were aspects of our business that quite candidly shut down. You know, the hospitality component of our business had shut down, and while our tasting rooms were closed, we created what we call a surge program where we were able to pivot um, our hospitality um, our hospitality folks into other aspects of our business that needed the help because of the pandemic. So as an example, while hospitality shut down, <laughs> customer service needed help. <laughs> um, <laughs> talent acquisition needed help. Um, we needed folks to help us run the bottling line for hand sanitizers. Like definitely we had employee volunteers, but we had folks that were able to pivot and, and help us with our, with our hand sanitizer. So that's something that I'm very proud of. Um, but again, it was all about, you know, what can we do to prioritize the health and safety of our employees? You know, one of the things that we learned pretty darn quickly is, um, is that when you do work in a family business, um, you know, and, and we, we take this very seriously, you know, all employee, all employees, we, we consider them extended members of, of the Gallo family. And, and I, I know that we've talked about this when, when you're in the middle of a crisis, you're starting to communicate and the communication, cause you got to get it out can come across as terse. <laughs> and so we received feedback from our employees that basically said, you know, you got to bring the human element back, back into it. I know that sounds a little bit crazy. So that's when we started CMO live. And that's when we started to over communicate leveraging technology. So, so we learned. Very interesting. And something, you know, not really about if you want business, but uh, family business, but you as a leader, I, there's a question that says, I saw recently that 850,000 women left the workforce in September due to COVID and burnout related causes. As a female leader at Gallo, how are you, are th how are you thinking about retaining female oh. I think it's just retaining talent in general, but but female talent in spe specifically. Um, that's why flexibility in our framework, empathy and compassion is is absolutely critical. And um, and one of our tenants, and I think that I often say this to to my female colleagues, is you cannot fail in silence. So when it when we first went into shelter in place in March, and schools literally within two weeks um, pivoted to online learning. Um, you know, we, we allowed people to make adjustments um, so that they could get their sea legs. What does that mean? Um, you know, where possible, you know, people would say to us, look, I will get the work done. <laughs> it's not gonna impact the work, but you know, can I work 
for example, um, an, a modified schedule. And, you know, and, and, and we did accommodate it. Um, and, you know, we now I think we're, we're past it, but when it first happened, that's what flexibility, empathy, and compassion meant. You know, um, it's the pressure when you're online. So our, our policy during um, work from home is that you have to have the video camera on at all times. Well, what does that mean? And it's happened to me. It's why I'm doing this video conference here, not at home, yeah. is, you know, kids walk in, you know, wanting help with their homework um, and giving people the grace to be able to tend to that, you know, um, uh, so, you know, I think that that's really one of the reasons why we want people to operate with flexibility and empathy and compassion so that people can have the opportunity to do what they need to do, um, to deal with their home life so that they can bring their full self to work. Absolutely. Uh, and I see a lot of other questions on wine. So let me ask you one, uh, which is Gallo has long sought to democratize wine for consumers. Where are the biggest opportunities for growth in this respect? So I think just to give you context, um, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of our talk that the wine industry had slowed down um, heading into January 2020. And I think, and I know that the primary reason for that is that as an industry in the United States, there's been, everyone has been on a mission to premiumize. And the notion of premiumization, I think, is very elitist. And what ended up happening is that you end up making the category very exclusive, not inclusive. And for us as an organization, because of our size and because we consider ourselves to be the industry leader, we fundamentally believe that for the category to grow, you have to make it inclusive and you have to make it accessible. And so we think that there's two areas of opportunity for growth moving forward. The first is that we have to welcome new consumers into the wine category. I was reading something that my grandparents wrote in the 1960s, and it's something that inspires us today, and we've pulled it forward into 2000. They had a mission um, that, or a motto that said, we want to endeavor constantly to win new friends for wine. And I love the word endeavor constantly or constantly endeavor, but, but adding the word constantly means that you constantly have to recruit new consumers into the category. So, so one is welcoming new consumers into the category. It's very important for me that our brands, our products, our organization reflects what America looks like today and what America is gonna look like tomorrow. So, so one, it's making it inclusive. The second area of growth for, for, for wine and specifically is to broaden the occasions where wine traditionally competes. And so we talk about wine has traditionally been relegated to what I'm gonna call the relaxed and unwind occasion, or more importantly, the food occasion around, around dinner. It's a very um, European point of view, but when you see where growth is coming from an alcohol beverage, wine needs to participate. One huge occasion is the day drinking occasion. It's why seltzers have exploded. You see why rosé has taken off. It's because rosé is now inserting itself into the day drinking occasion that has traditionally been dominated by beer and, 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 and spirit. So expanding occasions where wine can play is gonna be critical to that. So introducing new friends to wine and expanding occasions where wine, um, where wine can play is gonna be critical to that. That's amazing. And there's a question here, part of it might be what you already talked. Are there any new products and services that you offer to the customers which have been proven to make your brand remain on top, especially during this pandemic, compared to your closest competitors? And what do you think the most valuable aspect in your company brand in this recent time? And part of it might be what exactly you were talking, yeah. right? And but but I think there's more also specific. So um, I think that you know we as at Gallo, when you look at our portfolio of brands, um, we we want to build brands, and it takes time, it takes patience. Um, you have to manage the brand for the long term, and. 
I think that, and I, and I know this, is that we're benefiting from it during the pandemic where big brands or established brands or well-known brands are, 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 are winning, they're leading. Um, so that has been beneficial from you know, a new product standpoint. Uh, and this was started before COVID, but again, because we're welcoming new consumers into the wine category and we wanna win new friends for wine, we've really invested in what we're calling sweet tasting wines. We're unapologetic about it. Um, we, and that has been a beneficiary during COVID. Um, and we're gonna continue to not be apologetic about making our some of our wines sweeter than others. Um, new services, I hope, and we're learning, we're not great at this, virtual experiences, um, being able to offer curated virtual experiences for our consumers who don't have the luxury of traveling out to wine country uh, will be a new service that we're going to offer. We have to get better at it. You know, I know my mom's watching this segment and she watches all our events and I get free feedback all the time as to how we can improve our virtual experiences. Um, we have a lot to learn there, but but we're trying, we're we're learning as we go. So I think that that's going to be something that that we're gonna um, that we're gonna invest behind moving forward as well. And Ian, this is a question for someone who clearly knows all your brands, but is asking, <laughs> what is the value proposition of Gallo to wines like Palmyre, Orange, Swift, and other premium brands Gallo has acquired? So, you know, I think that um, our, our value proposition and, and when, you know, Dave Finney decided to sell to us and, you know, the Paul Meyer family, um, we, we want to maintain the integrity of the brand. We want, and I just had this conversation today with someone that when we acquire a brand, it's very important for us that we, 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 keep what made that brand special. And so in both those instances, the value that we add is that we have made investments in um, significant investments in premier uh, vineyards and in Napa and in Sonoma. And those brands will have access to what we think are some of the um, world-class vineyards that, um, that we've acquired over the the last couple of years only to improve the quality of the wines that they're offering. Not that they need to be improved, but to continue to accelerate it. So, um, you know, selling a brand, particularly in, in our category, is a very personal decision. Uh, folks spend lifetime building their brands that often represent their family's name. And for us, it's just really important that we continue to manage it for the long term. And continue to serve as a great steward over whatever they've created. And what is unique in marketing strategy for wine? Are you selling wine or selling something else more significant to consumer needs? Depends on the brand. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, it depends on the brand. Um, uh, it, you know, I think that at the end of the day, what wine is, is, is an image oriented category. And so, so you're selling a lifestyle, you're, you're selling an image. Um, there's some brands quite candidly um, that consumers come to them because they are the best value that is, that is offered. Um, so it just depends on the brand and, and what the brand stands for. It's not a one, it's not a, it's not a one size, it, it's, yeah. it's very bespoke. That's very interesting, and uh, that's a. I'm, I'm learning a lot, taking <laughs> notes. <laughs> There's a question. In a way, you, you were referring to something at the, at the beginning. Uh, what, what are your thoughts about wine travel? I have. That's that's not me. Someone else is asking. I have a small collection, and it was created as a result of getting to know people and families in yeah. Sonoma. Paso Robles. I bought wines based first on taste and based on people I want to support. I'm buying far less wine in this COVID, no personal because of no personal contact environment. So, I look at that as an opportunity. Um, I can tell you that um, look, 
we want wine tourism to continue. It's important for the local economy. It's important for people to experience brands. But what I could also tell you too, is that there are many wineries, big and small, and particularly small, that are really offering curated experiences with their winemakers, with the maker that you, that you could probably get um, an even more intimate experience. I know that that sounds crazy, but, um, but everyone is truly leveraging technology to create bespoke virtual experiences for, for their consumers. And I think moving forward, um, you're gonna see wine tourism um, hopefully come back <laughs> Uh, in its full force, but it's also going to be augmented by virtual experiences where um, where the winemaker and the producer can can meet people. I participated in some, you know, um, I hosted an Instagram live. You know, I, I had a fangirl moment with our uh, winemaker from New Zealand, Peter Jackson. He just finished harvest and the fact that I was able, like, you know, the chances of connecting with Peter on a one-on-one -on -one basis with flying over there and, and coming back, but I was able to talk to him about the 2020 vintage that he just completed and um, and getting his perspective on it in, in, in real time. And, you know, I I was sold. I did not need to go to New Zealand, um, but, but I think you're going to see a combination of both. I see. And, uh, you, you know, I don't want to leave outside because you mentioned e-commerce uh, uh, question. What do you see as the future of online sales and digital marketing in your industry? Actually, you just mentioned one and how you digitize the experience. But I think, other trends. I think one of the challenges with wine um, and how it's sold, and this is one of our tenants, it's one of our marketing points of view, is that as an organization, we have to make it easy for consumers to find, shop, um, and enjoy our brands. And I think that what e-commerce and digital marketing, virtual experiences do is that it fits nicely around enabling consumers to find the wines that they like, shop and enjoy brands. And so um, one of the main reasons why people, there's a lot of reasons why, but one of the main reasons why people don't engage in the wine category is that they have a hard time finding wines that they actually like. And I think that, um, E-commerce, digital marketing will, will enable us to facilitate that vision of making our category accessible and easily shoppable. There is also a question I was saying also still on the AI, whether you know the customized ads allow you to, to reach out to new customers yes. by pushing yeah. and pushing them towards specific yes. points. Yes, yeah. I call that aided selection, <laughs> but yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I see. Um, let me ask you also, you mentioned before uh, the California wildfires. How has that impacted the wine industry? Oh gosh. Um, you know, I think that, um, that, you know, first and foremost, I know many, friends from the Kellogg community have been so kind and, and have reached out to me personally wondering how, how we were doing. And what I can say is that for us, we were very fortunate that none of our wineries in Napa, Sonoma, and even the Central Coast sustained damage from the wildfires. Um, but um, unfortunately, you know, several of our industry colleagues, um, you know, weren't, weren't as successful. You know, we're a pretty resilient group as an industry. We'll get through it. Um, you know, I think that, um, what was extremely unusual about the wildfires is that, um, is the length of time that it lasted. I mean, it was going from August, I think the glass fire is finally contained at 90% in October. So, so you had three months of wildfires, um, normally it's a month. <laughs> uh, so yeah, people are tired. You know, the industry is tired. Um, even when you started to, from a hospitality standpoint, I know that wine tourism is something that many people are dependent on and they're now back opening up again, which is great. Um, but, but people are tired. I don't know what else to say. They're fatigued, but we're a resilient group and, and, and we're going to get through it. 
I see here a question more or less what I was going to ask you. How did Kellogg help shape how you are as a leader and marketer? And then I would add how it prepared you to lead through a crisis. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that while I was at Kellogg, I, I really, my leadership philosophy was really shaped by, by two key tenants. Um, the first is that leaders lead and, and, and folks that work with me know um, that I often say that leaders lead. And, and what that means is leading from the front. It means, um, it means may, willing to make the tough call. It may, not, it, it may be the hard call, but it's the right call. So making the tough call. Um, I also believe that leading from the front in crisis and what I've learned over the last seven months is that you don't have data, you don't have information and what you have to lead with is your intuition. And being able to trust your intuition, having the confidence that you're gonna go ahead and make a decision at the time and it may not be the right decision, but you have to make a decision. And so, you know, leaders lead from the front. Uh, the second tenant um, that Kellogg, I think, just really emphasizes is around the notion of servant leaders. And servant leadership is really around um, putting your employees' needs first. Um, you know, I read something today that I think is very Kellogg, but, you know, when you make a product and when you're responsible for a product, you have to know everyone who's involved in making that product from the grape grower to the winemaker to the people on the production line that are bottling your product to your distributors all the way to the end consumer. And I think that that's being humble enough, um, you know, to, to put your employees first and also never um, ask someone to do something that you're not willing to do yourself. So, I, so I, I, I look at that as servant leadership. I think the second question was, um, how did Kellogg prepare you? I don't know. You just, you just got to lead. I, you don't have a choice. You, you've been put in a position. You got to, you just got to, you got to do it. Um, you know, I have this saying that there's big jobs for big people and, and leaders have big jobs and that's what you're prepared to do. There's a question here from someone who knows you very well. And she writes, what I appreciate most about this conversation is how much you, Stephanie, haven't changed. <laughs> I had the pleasure of interning with Gallo as a full-time MBA in the summer of 2008. This is Lisa. Could you share your perspective on the importance of consistency, especially as a female leader? Oh gosh, I don't know how to, uh, you know, I, I, um, I will say this, that, um, that uh, the way to be consistent is to be authentic. Um, and I don't have time. I, you know, I, I don't know what it is, but, but you just have to be authentic to yourself and you have to show up being authentic. And, um, you know, I, I was talking to, um, to a group of MBAs yesterday, last night, and I think the ability to be authentic is to find an organization or a company where your personal values align with the company's values. And I think that, if you are lucky to find that perfect match, you can be consistent because you're presenting your full self at, at work. So I think that's the answer to that question. It's a hard question, so. Yes, but you gave a perfect answer, so. <laughs> um, so just to come back, we were talking about at the beginning, right? You have said that the Kelo culture and the Gallo culture are very similar. Can you elaborate a bit? You, you touched a little bit, but a bit more on the what are the similarities? And can you give also some more examples about the culture in action at Gallo? But by the way, the, the flexibility and yeah. the being ability to, to pivot onto hand sanitizer is the perfect example. But now we want to hear more. <laughs> I will tell you this if I were to use these words, uh, Francesca, tell me what this sounds like. If I were to use these words to describe a culture, whose culture is this? I'm going to go ahead and use the use these words: humility, integrity, commitment, teamwork, respect, and innovation. Yes, 
those are Stephanie Kellogg and <laughs> well, I'll tell you, those are gallows culture. That's those. That's that's um, that those are words to describe our corporate values. And um, you know, I think that um, that you know, I, I hope that throughout the fireside chat that I was able to give you examples of how we've been able to demonstrate humility, integrity, commitment, teamwork, respect, and innovation. Um, so that's, <laughs> I, so that, that's how, that's how I would answer that question. <laughs> Actually, um, let me ask you one thing though. You clearly had that culture at Kellogg, I assume for a long time, right? Because you come from a family business. So did you go to uh, Kellogg and found, you know, familiar, uh, you know, values? Did you bring back something? I think that, um, I've always made my decision, even from you know where I attended undergrad, it was always around fit for me. And it was never, it was always around, um, and I say fit, but now what I realize, what I mean is that my personal values align with, with the institution values. I think that what Kellogg emphasized for me and shed a light was the power of culture. And, um, and I was there when Dean Jacobs was there and um, the power of culture is something that your competitors cannot copy. Um, you can't, I think one of the first case studies, at least when I was there in organizational behavior was the Southwest Airlines case study. And it talked about the unique culture that Southwest Airlines had and how that that was its strategic advantage. And, um, and so for us coming back, I, I knew it was important to build an, a, a powerful culture and to do what we can to, to protect it, to maintain it and, 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 to, and to persevere. And you know, just to end our fireside checks, I know there's probably a little bit more questions and, and time is running out. What I can tell you is this, is that, um, Culture is tested in times of crisis. Um, and what I'm very proud of is that we've been tested. <laughs> uh, global pandemic, California wildfires, economic downturn, um, social unrest, um, pivoting our business in, in this time. And, and you know, our, our culture has been tested and I think it's why we're here and it's why we're continuing to persevere during these unusual times. So that's what Kellogg taught me is that you have, whatever you do, you do whatever the secret sauce is, is, is you, you have to maintain it and enhance it. That is a great message. It gives <laughs> me motivation. That's what Kellogg, you know, if, if, if that's what we're doing, it's, 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 it's great. It's great. Yeah. Uh, uh, I just have like one minute, like just one very more quick question. Someone says, how has the Kellogg community or Kellogg brand helped you after graduation? Oh gosh, I was just talking to someone about this today. Um, I would say that the primary help that Kellogg has given me, and I'm from the class of 1999, um, it's just an amazing network of friends that I can call on for advice, um, for perspective, for ideas. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example, particularly during COVID um, and even during the social unrest, I was struggling with some things. I just didn't know how to pivot our organization. And, you know, I reached out to, um, to a classmate of mine, as well as um, a member of the class of 2000. Um, there's, they're CMOs at other organizations. And I said, look, this is what I'm struggling with. Am I approaching it the right way? Um, what are you doing? And it really helped me form an opinion because you have to act pretty darn quickly. And being able to then come back and say, look, this is how this company's handling it, this company's handling it, and this is why this recommendation makes sense has been invaluable. So the network has been um, unbelievable. And, you know, even, you know, on another note, like, you know, as you progress in your career, it gets pretty lonely. And I had a pretty bad day um, a month ago, a very bad day <laughs> where my confidence was 
was wrecked and I, and I called some of my dear friends from Kellogg and I said, I feel like a bad CMO. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they helped me get my groove back. So, so being able to have a confidential group that I can go to, to pick me up when things are, are bad um, is definitely invaluable. <laughs> Well, I, could, I couldn't ask uh, to finish on a better note, on a better uh, message. So thank you so much, uh, Stephanie, you. for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you and hear about your philosophy, your values, and also how you're uh, definitely thriving despite uh, well, all uh, the challenges. Um, so, we have yeah. a lot of... So with that, you know, I will say this is that I hope to see you sometime in the near future um, when we come out at the other end. And I hope that we can enjoy a, 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 an amazing glass of gala wine when we're together next. I, I am definitely <laughs> on for that. <laughs> you know, I apologize that I still have so many questions. I apologize to the people. I couldn't use their questions, but they were, uh, uh, you, you know, I, I was frantically trying to to go through them and I still have plenty of left and that's a sign of uh, how much of a interest that you created. Uh, next month on November 16, we will have uh, David uh, Kohler, president and CEO of Kohler Company. Uh, and uh, in, in the meantime, uh, I hope you, I wish, I wish you a wonderful rest of the day or if you're towards the end of the day, like, like me, you know, for rest for the rest of the evening be well and safe and uh, thank you for coming thank you so much stephanie thank you